This special meeting of the Everett Public School Board of Directors is called to order. Will the secretary please read the roll? President Lusane. Present. Hello. Vice President Mitchell. She's present. She's parking the car. Director Mason. Present. Director Herman. Present. Director Nichols. Thank you very much. This meeting is called to order and um, Dr. Salzman, would you read the agenda for this, yes, this meeting? Uh, good evening, everybody. And thank you for being here. Today's uh, meeting is to discuss the audit uh, by the state auditors. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you. This is the exit audit conference. The exit audit conference. Thank you very much. And let's begin. I'll turn over control of the meeting to Ms. Andy Tess. Awesome. Thank you so much. I'm just going to make a round of introductions and then I will turn it over to um, our Washington State Auditor. So they are going to give us the information on our financial statement, uh, federal single audit report and accountability report for the 21-22 fiscal year. And we have Christina Baylor, our audit manager. Um, we have Courtney Amnison, our assistant audit manager, and Wendy Cho, our director of local audits. And then on the online, we have Maggie Wallace, our assistant state auditor. Thank you. And in attendance, again, are our board of directors. So if you have any special uh, questions earmarked just for them or you know comments, you can address them just as director. Okay. Perfect. Well, good afternoon, everyone. Um, it's a pleasure to be out here this afternoon and share the results in draft form for Everett Public School District for the 21-22 school year. Um, Maggie Wallace is going to be sharing a virtual presentation for us. So while she's getting that queued up on her screen, um, I'll take a moment for those of you, us that are in person just to introduce the packets that are in front of you. Um, so for our in-person attendees, we do have a packet of information that contains draft copies of all of the information that we'll be talking about in our virtual presentation. And for our members that are joining us virtually, uh, that same packet is available as an attachment. I believe that was sent out prior to this meeting, so you should have that available. Um, no need to have that in front of you. We'll be speaking directly from the virtual presentation, but if you'd like to see the details of the documents as we go through, we'll uh, make reference to some key page numbers that you can Thank see those you. So with that, we're going to go ahead and start with our first slide for you. So Maggie has our cover slide here, so we'll jump right into our kind of overview of the audit process in general. Um, so the state auditor's office takes very seriously our role to be auditors of all public funds. Um, that does give us the unique responsibility to audit all school districts within the state of Washington, as well as um, all other local governments. So your cities, your counties, your special purpose districts. Um, the role of an audit, we hope that you'll find is really viewed as a tool that you can use as members of the governing body, as well as management. Um, but our office does have three objectives that we really hope that you'll see from the audit process. Number one, you'll see increased trust in government. Really having an audit as a tool is really just another way to know how things are working. Um, we have the unique op opportunity to come in, talk with your staff, look at the actual um, activities that happen during the audit period, and really just report directly back to you if there's anything that you might benefit from knowing and any actions that you might want to take as a result of knowing um, how things are going. A second goal that we have is really conducting independent and transparent examinations is also really important, both to you um, in your respective roles, but also to your citizens. Um, so as the State Auditor's Office, we are independent from Everett Public Schools um, management. We do come in and we uh, report on what we do see as part of our audit. And then those results are shown directly on our website. So they're available for your stakeholders to view at any time, which is also really important to helping to build trust in the district's operation. And but lastly, our main goal is to help the district improve efficiency and effectiveness of your of your operations. Mm -hmm. So we know audits can result in no recommendations at all, or sometimes have recommendations. Um, whether it has recommendations or not, we really view um, you know the process of conducting an audit and reporting any recommendations to be really important. Mm -hmm. We really do take a look at any recommendations that come out of an audit to see first, do we need to report these items? And then two, you know, are they structured in a way that can be as helpful as possible to the district? 
So we'll walk through the results today. Um, the goal is to answer any questions that anyone has um, following the meeting before these results become official and on our website. Please know that we'll provide an opportunity at the end of our conference for questions. So if you could hold those until we get to that final slide, um, we'll take an opportunity to go through them then. So we are going to start with the first of three separate audits that we completed for the district, and that is a federal grant compliance audit. Um, Courtney is going to walk you through the results of that audit. All right, so we conducted a federal compliance audit for the period of September 1st, 2021 uh, through August 31st, 2022. And the goal of our federal compliance audit is to take a look at um, what the district did to ensure that they were in compliance with uh, the requirements that were laid out uh, by the granting agencies for each respective grant that we took a look at and selected for testing. And then at that point, we'll give an opinion on each of those programs. And so you'll see on the screen that we did um, give an unmodified opinion for two of the three programs that we did select for testing. Um, and then the third program uh, was the Emergency Connectivity Fund, and we are issuing an, uh, an adverse opinion for the issues that we identified related to that grant. Um, and so I'll be going over those in just a little bit to discuss that further. And then because we conduct our audits in accordance with uniform guidance, we are required to uh, take a look at the process that the district goes through to uh, make sure that you are in compliance and should we identify any potential weaknesses with that process, uh, we will then be reporting on that as well. Um, and identify specific to that emergency connectivity, I'll, talk, I'll uh, refer to that as ECF. Uh, we did identify some uh, material weaknesses as well as some material non-compliance that we are reporting. So again, we'll be discussing that uh, in just a little bit. Um, and so the actual programs that we selected for testing, uh, we took a look at the ECF grant, which I've already mentioned, uh, and that is entirely COVID funded. Uh, we also took a look at uh, Title I and then the Education Stabilization Fund, uh, which is also COVID funded. Um, and so we, for Title I and emergency or the um, education stabilization, we had really nothing uh, major to report on that, no, no big issues, which is wonderful. Um, and so those three programs made up approximately 55% of our total funding or the total funding that the district spent for mm -hmm. the 2022 school year. So I'm gonna go into, there's a couple of slides we're gonna talk about the ECF, but I'm gonna start with just a general overview of kind of what, what happened um, and how this program came to be and uh, you know the results of it. So the Emergency Connectivity uh, Fund, this grant, it was created in May of 2021. And it was intended to provide computers and internet access to allow uh, teachers and students to engage in remote learning. And in 2021, in May of that time when it started, we will probably never forget that everything was really, it was remote and we were either fully remote or you were in hybrid. And it was, you know, everyone had a lot of fun trying to make sure that all the students were able to mm -hmm. learn. And it was very important to have access to computers in order to continue that remote learning. And so when this program came out, um, the district uh, applied for and received approval in July of 2021 um, to fund computers related to this. Um, and by that point, the district was then moving into the 2021 school year, 22 school year, um, to go actually go back in person, which is wonderful. Um, but then at that time when that grant funding was still coming out, it was really important to push out that you know, get the funding out quickly with all the COVID funds. It was important to get that money out, use it. And with that, the compliance and the guidance for how to use those funds were basically trying to play catch up during that period of time. So at the point of application, mm -hmm. um, and the application really just required the district to provide an estimate of how much and what the funds were needed for. Um, there was some guidance, there was some rules of order, there was some um, FAQs related to this program, um, but there was continued guidance that was coming out from the point of application um, all the way through reimbursement. Um, yes, all the way to the point where we were auditing. So this has been a regular catch-up phase for this program. Mm -hmm. um, but the one thing that has was pretty clear from the FCC, from your granting agency that came out, was that there were some items that really needed to be defined by the district um, from after that application point up until reimbursement. And the first one was defining what the unmet need was um, and identifying which students or student groups or teachers uh, had that met that requirement, and then um, only requesting reimbursement for those students and teachers that met that unmet need. 
um, and then making sure that there were controls in place to make sure um, that you could show that there was support that only uh, one piece of equipment was issued to each uh, person that met that unmet need requirement. And so by the time that 2021-22 school year um, started and at that point when the district requested reimbursement, um, you were in person and most of the, the computers that were issued for this round of uh, funding were for elementary students who were in classroom and um, no longer in the remote setting um, on a regular basis as they were when this funding first came out. And so as we then came on afterwards, uh, a year later, we have to take into consideration all of the guidance as the district does of what um, we're supposed to be testing to. And so your granting agency, the FCC, they provide what's called a compliance supplement that gives clarification for what we are to evaluate, what they want us to evaluate the grant funds for. Um, that's a part of the standard practice. We take that compliance supplement and really utilize that in determining what to test. And so from reviewing the documentation that was provided at the time of reimbursement, uh, there were some items that the district did, were not able to provide that support for. Uh, the first one was how the district defined unmet need um, after, after the application process, um, that the district only requested reimbursement for equipment and um, services provided to students and staff that would otherwise lack um, devices sufficient to engage in that remote learning requirement. Um, and that the district didn't have controls to show or pro, uh, documentation to show controls in place uh, for how one student um, received or each student received one piece of equipment um, that was purchased with those funds. Maybe we can pause here sure. just, just to get everyone to catch up. So on the screen in front of us, um, we'll go into the details of what Courtney is um, discussing in just a moment. But on the screen in front of us, this is an overview of what the specific requirements are that um, need to be tested from an auditor, from an audit of this program. You can see on this particular grant, there were six separate requirements that the auditor had to go through and test. Um, two of the six, period of performance, which is, did you purchase the computers during uh, the available period that the grant allowed? And did you track the equipment? The second um, item is um, there was specifications on what you needed to include in your equipment listing um, that were really, really specific on mm -hmm. what the grant wanted to see. Um, mm -hmm. Did you adequately track all of that equipment in accordance with the grant terms? So you'll see we're marking those as okay. So two of the six requirements we mm -hmm. have no um, significant recommendations with. Mm -hmm. um, that does leave the four out of the six where Courtney's um, giving you a preview of kind of what the audit found. Mm -hmm. What's important to note here is three of the four are related to the same concept, the de definition of unmet need and what documentation can we see during the audit process and at the time of the reimbursement. Mm -hmm. um, one item is not related to those. One item is related to procurement. Um, we were required to look at the district's procurement to make sure um, you actually followed with the more restrictive of state or federal mm -hmm. laws. Um, in Washington state, the state laws are more restrictive than the federal procurement. So we were able to see that the district followed a competitive procurement process. I mm -hmm. think it was DES, if, if that's mm -hmm. right. There was just a slight um, difference in what the amounts paid from what the contract DES negotiated. And um, to kind of clarify mm -hmm. on that too, it, it had no impact to the actual funding itself. So we were capped at what we could fund. And so um, the reimbursement has been issued. It was less than $10,000 yeah. impact. Um, and federal requirements based on the conversations I've had with the auditors are more restrictive than our state requirement. So it's almost like you don't, we had a review process. We reviewed the, the, the piece of it. It's it, we missed an item and then it's like there's no room for a mistake mm -hmm. in that whole process and so that was sort of um the conversations we went back and forth mm -hmm. on you either get this or this and it, it, it there's not a lot of flexibility in that and so um at first we didn't think it was going to go that way and so um it is it, it is it doesn't give any room for a mistake human error which any process has a human error element to it. So, mm -hmm. yeah. But we follow federal procurement laws, but not the state. It's, and the federals are more restrictive than the states. Is it was, it's flip flop. It's flip -flop. We follow the laws. What, what we contend is that we didn't, we didn't find the error in pricing when we did the review sure. itself. Mm -hmm. And it was nominal in nature. We requested the funds back from them, which we, we've already received the funds back from them. And it was less than $10,000. And it actually didn't even impact the federal grant in, in any way. We would have claimed the same amount of money no matter what. 
Yeah, there are no question costs mm -hmm. for this okay. component unit of the grant, um, but the process of verifying that, that the actual amount that was negotiated was paid, that was where the That's difference the was difference. Yeah. yeah, so no question costs. The grant actually capped how much you could receive in reimbursement for each piece of equipment to up to $400 mm -hmm. per laptop, or I think it was $250 per hotspot. So um, that is less than what you're actually paying for these units. Um, so no question cost, just a compliance item. Just on compliance this one. Oh, okay. Yeah. Um, but the other three um, are related to um, that restricted purpose of the grant um, mm -hmm. and defining, you know, which students or staff um, should have an unmet need um, for the district's definition, and could we see the documentation that that the equipment only went there. So. That's gonna bring us to our next step of the uh, process, which is uh, the audit finding. So Courtney kind of um, gave you a preview of that. If you'd like to see the details of the audit finding for our in-person attendees, those are gonna start on page six of your financial and federal audit report. Yeah. For our virtual attendees, um, you should have one packet of information and that should start on approximately page 10 of that packet. And I, what I want to call out too in regards to this is that we have an opportunity to respond to this finding and the district doesn't concur with the auditor's response in, um, in regards to this. Um, and so we believe we've provided documentation and I haven't gotten clarity actually from them of why our documentation isn't sufficient. Um, and so that is the disconnect between what the auditors are are the compliance supplement and based on our expectation of looking through the funding compliance documents. The other consideration too is that they're auditing to a later, they're auditing to standards that were issued after we submitted claims at certain point in mm -hmm. times. And that's a disconnect between the, us and, and, the, and the federal government. We shouldn't, districts shouldn't be held accountable for compliance supplements that are provided after the fact and and how would how would even districts even have known to go back and so there's no way we could have ever gone back if that's if that's the standard that the auditors are going to when they're issuing things after the fact okay yeah, and that's a really good um, conversation. Mm -hmm. And actually, one of the things that we would like to share with you is, is we actually agree in some effort that, that the communication could have been improved from the federal government, mm -hmm. that the timing of it kind of building. So um, there were multiple documents, first and foremost. Mm -hmm. You know, there were the originated documents. Right. Then the FCC had a frequently asked questions document that they continued to build on. There were um, several editions of that, and they continued to add more to that. Um, the version that was available um, in the summer was a good start. There was some information available, but they really got into new levels of detail towards, mm -hmm. I think it was October of 2021, and then more in 2022, and then even some this year as this program continues. So one of the things that our state auditor really feels very strongly about is providing feedback to FCC on how this is impacting the schools in our state. Um, we, I'm going to let Wendy talk about this because she has definitely um, had that global view in our agency. But in your packet, and mm -hmm. um, we'll go to the next slide, if you will, Maggie, um, in your packet, you'll see that we've included um, a copy of a letter that our state mm -hmm. auditor sent directly to the FCC. And, and I'll turn it over. Yeah, thank you, Christina. I think, Andy, you said it best, the disconnect. Um, and so in what our state auditor, Pat McCarthy, had done was she actually wrote a letter directly to the FCC. Mm -hmm. It was dated May 30th. So you should see that in your packet. Mm -hmm. Actually communicating that FCC, when they were communicating to the school districts, they were not as clear as they should have been with their expectations for this program. And Pat McCarthy, uh, our state auditor, um, asked the FCC take those into consideration when working through the audit resolution process with the school districts. Because mm -hmm. once you have this finding, the next step is the district will work with the granting agency, which is FCC, on what's next. And so a couple of things I wanted to just mention in this letter um, is Pat actually talks about, you know, the guidance that was given to the district. There was a lot of information, lengthy at parts, some were like, you know, over 100 pages, but the guidance didn't clarify or state what is the appropriate level of documentation, mm -hmm. especially when it comes to ensuring audit compliance for the special needs or for the unmet needs and the um, per limit, per user limitations, that special test and provisions that Christina was just talking about. Mm -hmm. And instead, what was provided to the districts was that districts should be prepared to produce documentation for audit compliance. 
And we and we worked mm -hmm. and we provided documentation. And in fact, we provided a three page letter, I think it was, with all the documentation mm -hmm. and why we um, don't agree with the conclusion in that regard. Um, mm -hmm. The other piece that the um, the guidance said was that there really shouldn't be any specific metrics or um, or definitions on what Ed Met and Need was. And so we there's again another disconnect with us mm -hmm. and the auditors. How are you providing us information that we haven't met Ed Met Need when there wasn't supposed to be any specific measures or measures based on the original funding compliance right. um, document. So, so the original funding document did not state it, what the, the definition of unmet needs. It said the be. districts were the ones who had the best ability to that determine is. what unmet mm -hmm. need was. Right. And we assess the unmet need as the fact right. that all uh, our devices mm -hmm. weren't powerful enough to operate a classroom at home. And so you couldn't right. run Zoom, you couldn't do all these things, you couldn't have access. And, and we clearly think that the access is the most important piece in regards to that. Mm -hmm. And so um, we believe that our unmet need was far beyond of what we requested. Our original assessment was over 6,500 devices. We only requested for 4,000 devices of funding. Mm -hmm. um, and for example, they aren't questioning cost on our devices related to our um, Ever Virtual Academy program. And so part mm -hmm. of that piece of that is, is in there. Um, and so even though we believe all of our elementary school devices is really because we didn't at that point in time we didn't know what was going to happen if we needed to go home if we we're going to have to pivot at any point in time and so we believe all of those devices the intent was to one reduce the homework gaps and and really the unmet need is to have access at home um, in those devices and so that was clearly communicated to staff that they should be checked out to students at any point in time that they were available for them to come home and so we have documentation all around that that we provided to the auditors oh, okay. um, and so um, ultimately the conclude there's Still, again, I still don't necessarily agree with their conclusion, um, but um, we at this point have to go forward now with the FCC and working with them on their, they'll do another review of the documentation. And, and not to um, cut you off at Mumpy and stuff. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know how I've been feeling about this. Absolutely. Absolutely. And I appreciate mm -hmm. your relationships about four years since we've been together. So, one piece, as you know, I want to be clear on is that in that original statement, which I read over and over again. Thank you, board, for letting me have that opportunity. <laughs> it said districts knew what's best with the unmet need. Yeah. Right? And, and that mm -hmm. sticks out. I'm, and I'm sorry not defending this, but I have to get no, off my chest. Absolutely. Yes. Absolutely. And uh, I have to say this, and yeah. I, I know you've met with others, you know, 26 other districts with this fine, but in that statement, mm -hmm. that, that, that is golden that districts knew the best how to meet this unmet need. Um, I just want to say this as you mm -hmm. go on, and I'm, I'm holding it if you tell me I should wait to the end, but I want to mm -hmm. say this. First district in the nation with COVID. Mm -hmm. First district in the nation with COVID. Mm -hmm. My community and our kids are all unmet needs during that, mm -hmm. right? According to the, the federal guidelines, every child the amount of COVID was beginning or ending was an unmet need mm -hmm. to keep education going. I appreciate your office. I appreciate uh, the state auditor writing that letter. Mm -hmm. I did reach out to Patty Murray because it's kept mm -hmm. me up. It's yeah. kept me up for, yeah. for many weeks, mm -hmm. okay? Because it's a gut wrencher to our community, to our staff, because mm -hmm. we did everything for our youngsters. Mm -hmm. right? We didn't stop during the COVID. We educated. And... Uh, I just want that to be said, and, and I, I think Andy said everything there, but and especially when it came to hot spots, mm -hmm. we were the only one in the Western Washington area that had the first hot spots. At that time, I had another board member asking me where are the hot spots, and we got them right away. If you remember, we worked with Rick Larson's office to make sure they were done. Mm -hmm. Okay, I was working with my chair at the time to make sure everything was going on during COVID for the kids. Mm -hmm. The guidance to the districts. Mm -hmm. The original document changed. I, you guys know that. Too. I want that. It changed during this time frame as we're being audited. Okay, so it may not change the finding, but I want it to be clear, not only to my board, mm -hmm. your teamwork with us is that that changed. Okay, as as we get a, you know, districts, you know, the unmet need move forward, and as we go through the process, uh, it changed and. Uh, I just want it to be known because the compassion that we have for our youngsters, 
everything yeah. with the federal government yeah. because we didn't leave these kids stranded. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Right? right. And I think that's really important because uh, yeah. the federal government has paperwork and, and rules mm -hmm. will follow. Mm -hmm. But they had the, that line there was districts know mm -hmm. the unmet need. Yeah. And here's a community of youngsters, mm -hmm. 19,900 at the time, that even though we're we're exiting it. We never really exited that year, right? We're just beginning yeah. to come back. So I just want it to be known. Yeah. And I think your your state auditor, uh, I think she, you know, she understands that letter really helps. Right. But I just have to say that as a superintendent yeah. of, of the school. Right, absolutely. And you know, the, the letter Pat talks about on page two that mm -hmm. districts were communicated that they were in the best position to know. And so, of course, in all the many conversations that we've had with our districts, that is the same feedback we've been receiving. And going back to, you know, where Pat's coming from is there has to be clear expectations. And then the other piece of it that I wanted to mention in the letter was exactly that. The compliance supplement then comes out. Out, and that's what we have to audit to. And so when we take all these factors into consideration, the compliance supplement comes out and there's more clear guidance there. And so the recommendation from Pat to FCC was God established clear expectations. What came out after the fact didn't line up with what was happening in the yeah. onset. Yeah. Exactly. exactly. And then I would say, you know, um, I, we were chatting earlier about summer break, three kids, boys for me too. Um, as a mom of three boys that just finished seventh, fifth, and third, my district as well as Everett Public Schools and all your neighboring community districts, I know did, you know, this is a documentation piece for the ECF program. Mm -hmm. It's documentation, but the unmet need of what you're saying absolutely is greater of how you all protected our kids and made sure that their mental health, their academic structure as you transitioned from remote hybrid to then in person, even now, we still, as parents, and I'm sure as oh, educators, yeah. you feel oh, yeah. that there's still mm -hmm, a mm -hmm. trickle effect in the transition. So this is a documentation piece with the finding, and that's the difficult piece of right, right. its federal funds, the compliance supplement um, from FCC, from the grant tour. Um, so it's in that letter that Pat wrote was to have FCC take that into consideration right, right, right. when they are working through the audit resolution process. Can you remind me that when did the supplement come out and what's the timing of that? April 2022. So, so April 2022. And we applied right. for the funding in July of 2021. Yeah. Right. So we're talking. And that's the audit procedures. There was a frequently mm -hmm. asked questions yeah. document that was um, available in its initial onset when the district applied, and then they added more questions um, between early, um, you know, May of 2021 and the compliance supplement. Right. I think they did a revision in October of 2021, and then again in early 2022. They they continued to put out information, um, mm -hmm. and they even as recently as. March of 2023 mm -hmm. sent out another mm -hmm. communication saying, mm -hmm. you know, reminding yeah. everyone of Have the requirements. Documents. So the, the initial was districts mm -hmm. know best how to do this unmet need. Okay. And then the spring of the next year comes more information about it, well, this is how mm -hmm. this is what we would like mm -hmm. to see. And we're purchasing the devices before yeah, beforehand. Yeah, yeah, at the beginning. At I mean, the beginning, it's, it's, it's not a year later. Right. Yeah. Right. And, yeah. you know, for perspective, outside of schools, we saw this with other grant funds mm -hmm. during the pandemic. Yes. You know, the rush to get federal funds out to yes. service the community often came yeah. before all of the criteria. And yeah. so it was yeah. kind of a catch-22. Mm -hmm. You had to get the assistance to be able to help your community, yeah. but sometimes that other layer of what to follow wasn't there yeah. yet. And then also to bring it kind of full circle, if you look at the way we've been with our SR dollars, which is like the significant majority of our federal mm -hmm. funding in the past two years, we have not had any issues in regards to that. Right. Um, and so with all of that, I, I feel like one, the district wants to do it right, has the mm -hmm. and understands the guidance and, and needs clarity from the FCC yeah. um, or what the requirements are. But we're when we have that clarity, we are doing it right, right. and we are mm -hmm. and then we are in compliance. And mm -hmm. we typically, yeah. you know, that's the mm -hmm. end all goal for us in that end of it. And we haven't had any major issues with our federal funding and mm -hmm. since I've been here, to be Absolutely. honest. So. Yeah, yeah. I think that's where, and I know I think you have more presentation to give, but the takeaway is sort of to 
ask. It, it appears that if they're not going to be That's offering exactly that clarity, right. we need to we need to almost pull it from them, unfortunately. And I see your point by pulling it forward because I look at the letter and I'm I'm mm -hmm. I'm wondering in a in a sense when it says as a result, many school districts could not provide information mm -hmm. information supporting unmet need, but when the school districts have already been told you already know best mm -hmm. and then we take action on that that we know best mm -hmm. it didn't say to provide it at the beginning mm -hmm. it didn't say you know it said you know best how to determine that and then it says uh this lack of documentation no if we knew best then we knew we need we were giving it to the right and fulfilling the requirements yeah. So I, I think that's, I'm wondering if that's saying, you know, from the beginning, we were always doing something wrong. Is is that what she's trying to say? Mm -hmm. Or what what is she trying to say? No, Just, um, Pat is more trying to communicate to FCC, you know, the communications to districts in the beginning was you are in the position to know best. And then the information that was provided, kind of that timeline that Christina mm -hmm. and Courtney were describing, all that information coming in, um, it was a lot of information, but in the beginning, it didn't ever quite say what's that appropriate level of documentation. Mm -hmm. Kind of on um, that, let's see, I thought I had it. Uh, kind of the what's the appropriate level of documentation in regards to what we're seeing with a lot of the findings is the special testing provisions, the unmet need and the per user per location limitation, which then ties into your activities of lab, kind of in that chart that. Christina okay. had shared, but kind of on that first bullet point there on page one, Pat just touched about, there's a lot of information that was given, but there's no detailed guidance indicating the type of records that schools okay. should keep. Instead, what it was saying was, what guidance was there was that schools should be able to provide documentation to support audit compliance. And, and to be honest, we've provided that support and I still don't have clarity on why that support wasn't mm -hmm. sufficient. So, so um, does that come out? Is is this an ongoing process? So this is an this is an exit interview, but it sounds like is there we won't have any room to this? make mitigation with the auditors on their recommendation outside of the finding response. So the next step will be working with the FCC and they'll do their own review. Okay. And so they're ultimately the what I what a communication I've received from the FCC is they're ultimately the the, the final decision maker on regards mm -hmm. to um, the funding compliance piece of it, but they they can't um, they they they're they don't and they're because they're separate entities, their finding will stand and then we'll go through that piece of that process. I got you. Yeah. Okay. And I think Pat's message is F C you did this wrong. You gave different rules during the game changed all the time. I think she's mm -hmm. supporting right. local districts yes. and taking on the federal government. Yes. Am I correct? Yes. To that after reading this over and over again in my yes. conversation with mm -hmm. Senator Murray. Right. Because the, the, the holding of the money is the federal government. Right. Exactly. With the rules that started one way mm -hmm. and ended up changing at the end mm -hmm. of the game. And even the compliance supplement that we have to audit to is from the FCC. And right. so um, there definitely is the disconnect and the establishing. The letter kind of goes on, I think, page two or three, talking about this, um, page top of page three, consider adding clear expectations mm -hmm. and um so what we've been telling our districts is anything that you have um, to gather that and share it with FCC during the audit resolution process, because they are the ones, like you said, Andy, that will take the results from the report and then coordinate mm -hmm. with the districts. Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay, I understand. Okay. Well, if there's no other questions on the finding for now or the letter, we'll continue on. Like, people on Zoom, oh, if they have mm -hmm. any questions. Or... Caroline, do you have any questions? Okay. Tracy? I think we lost Tracy. Yeah, we lost Tracy. She had to leave 10 minutes and she'll be back. Yeah. Okay. Okay. All right. Well, we'll continue on for the financial statement results. And then... I'll turn it back to you, Courtney. All right. So for the financial statement audit, uh, we took a look at the same period, September 1st, 2021 through August 31st, uh, 2022. And uh, the intent behind the financial statement audit is to 
determine whether or not these financial statements can be uh, relied upon for uh, decision making, and we will then give an opinion on that. So you will see right there that we are issuing an unmodified opinion, which is a clean opinion. This is exactly what you want to see on your financial report. Um, in addition, we also take a look at the process that the district goes through to prepare the financial statements. Um, should we identify any potential weaknesses, we are uh, required to then report that, um, but we are very pleased to report we did not identify any any uh, weaknesses in that process. So again, that's what you want to see in this report. Um, and then we also take a look at any compliance with any laws, regulations, um, grant agreements that could potentially have an effect on the fair presentation uh, of your financial statements. Um, and again, we did not identify any instances of non-compliance that could have an effect. So your financial report is uh, exactly what you want to see. Um, and then there are a couple of items that we are required to communicate with you. Uh, the first one is if we identified any material misstatements, any really large errors that needed to be corrected by the district, mm -hmm. we had none of those. Mm -hmm. um, we also have some uncorrected misstatements, just very minor items that are included on the um, document, on the exit agenda, the last page. Um, these are items that we have discussed with management. We're in agreement that the need to make these changes is not necessary because it doesn't affect your opinion. So, mm -hmm. uh, but we are required to provide those to you. And those are actually, if you're following along in person, those are in the document on the left hand side at the very top. Um, and and these typically get corrected in the future years. Right. So it's yep. more of a timing yeah. issue. Yeah. The the accountability yeah. Or, yeah. Uh, so on the left. Exit conference packet on the left. That. Oh, so that's the very document. Yeah, yeah, here we go. I got it. And at the very back. And for if for our, our folks online, that would be page four of the packet, page four of the exit conference yeah. agenda as well. Yes, I saw that. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, but as Andy mentioned, these are something that we'll take a look at in the next audit. And okay. More, so. and, and typically it's a, a calculation yeah. minor mm -hmm. issue. They're, not, they're very minor in nature. We're aware of them and we work to clean them up for next year. Well, and that's common it, practice to have. Yeah, I think these things. are helpful and I think you probably find them yeah. helpful to have someone really going through yeah. the budget. Yeah. I have a um, question so, um, just in terms of um, clarification <laughs> and may be helpful for some others. Um, so can you sort of talk through the different levels? So there's significant deficiencies, there's material weakness, material misstatements, and uncorrected misstatements. Is is that kind of in order of like how bad it is versus, <laughs> you know, <laughs> significant, yeah. I should say, how significant it is or? Yeah. So if you had um, significant deficiencies or material misstatements, those are really large errors mm -hmm. that you would need to correct mm -hmm. before we could even issue an opinion. Is, would you call statement. both of those a finding? <laughs> yes, those yeah. would result in a finding. finding. So, okay. And you don't okay. have any findings related okay. to your financial statements. Okay, so, gotcha. Yeah, and then the uncorrected misstatements, those are just very minor items that mm -hmm. don't affect your opinion. So leaving them as is, we're in agreement. It it doesn't need to be changed right. right now. Yeah, I understand that one. And then, what is a material weakness? Uh, material weakness would be if we found um, a, a, an issue <laughs> with the process that you use to create your financial statements um, that was so uh, significant that it would also result in a finding that mm -hmm. the the weakness wouldn't identify or wouldn't catch an, a really large error essentially. So okay, so then. Just to jump back, what's the difference between a significant deficiency and a material weakness? So that really depends on the size of the error. So mm -hmm. material misstatements, or we're going to get technical just slightly, is basically if you see an error that's more than 10%, okay. that is when you get in, jump from significant to material. Okay. So significant is less than 10%. Mm -hmm. um, material is when you get above 10%. Mm -hmm. um, and so that's each yeah. auditing office defines materiality. 10% yeah. is the materiality that we use typically mm -hmm. of assets and expenditures. Mm -hmm. um, when a significant deficiency is, is something that could be less than 10%, but usually no smaller than five. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. all of these uncorrected misstatements are so far so below bad. 5%, they're immaterial. Yeah. Right. Okay. When you think of 5% of your entire budget, 
Is that five percent with it of what? Of like total assets or okay. total yeah. expenditures. And it's it's by some of your funds, yeah. Too, so it gets more complicated. Oh, okay. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Just for clarity, too, um, as you you were kind of talking about exit items and and mm -hmm. and there, there's a level of reporting that happens. So exit items are typically the cleanup items that mm -hmm. are just minor in nature. Um, that they don't like they're not that yes. really they're just mm -hmm. housekeeping items like mm -hmm. oh we recommend you do this it'd be better for you mm -hmm. and then right. there's um the the management reporting which mm -hmm. would be which gets reported to um the board um as well and it's kind of a higher level than exit items and then there's the finding which is where you get to that level where it's a significant deficiency or material weakness and for federal funds just for, mm -hmm. for some clarity there is no middle ground you're either mm -hmm. at an exit only yes. or you're at a finding they don't go in the middle like they will with the accountability mm -hmm. or our financial statement audits and so when we were talking about the procurement item that's really mm -hmm. we had conversations oh this is minor it's not that big of a deal and then it went up and they're like well no it's going to be there because they don't have that middle of the road reporting mm -hmm. piece okay and when you talk about procurement item mm -hmm. that give was, me some i know but give me some kind of uh, background as to what kind of item that would be for example, in this this issue for the ECF funds, where we didn't notify that one uh, one of the items was incorrect on the, on the contract, looking at it, so it was so small, it was eight thousand dollars, but there, but the auditors are recommending a finding for that because of the um, because of the federal piece to that. Now, if that was a state issue, it would have probably been an exit item. If it was state funded, it wouldn't have gone to the level of of reporting. That's really sure. interesting we'll for the procurement yeah. of computers. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. But if we were like to um, procure, when you say 10%, and suppose we procured a bus, mm -hmm. a van, in the big scheme of things, mm -hmm. you know, when you kind of look at the entire <laughs> procurement activities that go on here, I wanted to find out what is. What does that mean? Five percent that one bus versus yeah. ten buses or so what? the, the yeah. percentages are applied to our financial statement mm -hmm. audit typically. Mm -hmm. Um we don't usually use the percentages in our accountability audit. And mm -hmm. in accountability, we're interested in any and all procurement just to make sure that the district is, you know, adhering to state laws on procurement. Mm -hmm. In the federal audit, we don't use the same five and ten percent. Basically, the federal guidelines require that we take a look at what the grant funds were spent on intended and in, for yep and in this case it was the <clears throat> it equipment mm -hmm. and so if that is there are some percentages but not the same there's not the five percent in mm -hmm. federal grants so basically if you spend more than ten percent of your grant on procurement we have to test it mm -hmm. and then under federal guidelines we have to see if there's a control to make sure that you paid the exact same price if you're piggybacking mm -hmm. using in this case using a des contract and if you don't then the federal guidelines say well the control wasn't effective there was a difference noted mm -hmm. and that's where you get into that black and white scenario mm -hmm. so it's mm -hmm. it's small compared to the district's overall procurement mm -hmm. that you mm -hmm. do but because it was a large portion of this grant that and grant. we have to test yeah. this mm -hmm. grant requirement it triggered the finding i got you so okay. it really depends on where it comes mm -hmm. up in the yeah. audit and yeah. what we're looking at mm -hmm. I know. And the difference between <laughs> federal and state, I guess I hadn't realized yeah. that. Mm -hmm. that was really yeah. yeah. There's more flexibility in an accountability yeah. audit. Yeah. Uh, looking at the bigger picture. Yeah. yeah. So, so uh, such fun questions. <laughs> Exciting. Right. Right. That's a good standard. Mm -hmm. And they even monitor, like, what got me is when you said you, you paid more for it. And so there was a difference of less than $10,000, but we were able to read recoup yep. that difference. My question is, um, and that's the federal grant, mm -hmm. but if it's just an accountability audit based on just general spending and procurement mm -hmm. of items, right. like I mentioned buses, because I was getting away from the federal aspect yeah, of right. it, if it was a bus or a contractor to do HVAC or mm -hmm. a contractor to perform XYZ, how do how does that differ? Well, in accountability, what we're focused on is is the district getting the best price. And sometimes we don't always ask for the district to recoup 
recoup the funds. That's a good process mm -hmm. for you to do. If you see that you were mischarged, you should definitely do that. But what we're really focused on is, is the district following with all the procurement laws so that you obtain the lowest price for the product and it's a compliance item. Yeah. It's not, mm -hmm. not necessarily, um, you know, a use of public dollars. It's like, did you adhere to mm -hmm. the, the strict rules of, you know, procuring these items? These items. And they'll look okay. at multiple contracts. Yeah. So they'll yeah. identify mm -hmm. a, a multiple levels of contracts to look at. Um, mm -hmm. and I may have done that review in the past, mm -hmm. and I anticipate they'll be doing that review next year, actually, again. Um, and so it's something they do on, an, on, on a cyclical basis um, in the accountability, and they'll focus on different areas. Mm -hmm. Sometimes it's um, accounts payable. Sometimes it's our travel process. Sometimes it's our procurement process, or it, there could be other processes that they're looking at, attendance reporting, and multiple different areas, depending on sort of what they haven't tested in the past or what they feel they need to look at um, um, as they go through their identifying those kind of approaches. So they have, they'll pick different items, like ASB was one that they picked this year for the accountability. That's one they often cycle through every couple of years. Mm -hmm. and that's a mm -hmm. wonderful segue for the accountability. <laughs> <laughs> just, just a couple of <laughs> then we'll, we'll be done with financial discussion. Um, so there are a couple of things we do want to discuss very quickly. Uh, during our financial audit, uh, we did take a look at some uh, risks that we wanted to share with you. Uh, the first one was whether or not we identified any potential instances where management was able to circumvent uh, yes. the control process. Mm -hmm. We did not find that, that mm -hmm. in any instance, mm -hmm. so that's great. Uh, we also took a look at the implementation of a new standard, GASB 87. Mm -hmm. uh, this was specific to leases. Um, this was uh, required for um, all districts uh, for the 2022 period. This was new. So again, our police report, we did not identify any issues with the implementation of that new standard as well. So great job to the district. There's clarity in our rules. <laughs> <laughs> Sometimes too much. Yes. <laughs> Going back, just new. for clarity for me, when you say management overrides controls, what does that mean? Yeah, so um, nationally, when auditing standards come out, they um, one of the more recent changes is that they would like auditors to assess your financial folks, like Andy and her team, mm -hmm. and just the natural risk that comes with being a person in your finance department, having access to the district's finances, and any potential ability to manipulate um, you know, mm -hmm. those numbers or the reporting or anything that could go wrong. Um, it's an inherent risk of being in a, a finance position. And so auditing standards I want the auditors to assess that in any control environment, just to make sure that they don't see anything that rises mm -hmm. to the level of, of a potential concern. Mm -hmm. So this is a significant risk that we look at for all of our Local yeah, it seems like you do that all the time, exactly. every year. Yeah, We've always do that. done it. Mm -hmm. We just have started including it in our... Uh, New exit package. conference to let you know oh. that whether or not we did identify okay. that. So okay. this gotcha. is not new, it's just we're reporting on it to you. You're reporting on yes. it. So this will be a continual thing that you will be reporting on. It's a new audit standard with a clarification of an expectation that they expect auditors mm -hmm. to assess this and report on it in all of our audits. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Mm -hmm. All right, so the last slide about financial statements. Uh, the district for many years has gone for the uh, Certificate of Achievement for Excellence in Financial Reporting. So they have chosen to go for it again this year. This is an optional award that is offered through the Government Finance Officers Association. Um, by going for this award, there are some additional uh, schedules and um, information that the district prepares and provides to our office that we take a look at and review. Um, and then uh, we will then report on that and provide a letter um, to be able to submit for that award. And so that letter was issued in April, which I believe you have all received the email letting you know that we were able to provide that uh, for the district to submit for that award. So congratulations. Mm -hmm. yeah, again. Thank you. Thank you for doing so, that. Yeah. I have a question maybe for Andy. Um, this is awesome, first of all. Thank you. It's always yeah. great to see this come through. Um, what what value does that bring the district? Does that have to do with like our rating, like our bond so, rating, or is it just, um, you know, a big kudos for our community that there's tighter controls and that we've risen to a higher level than most districts? You you were spot on on two of them. So one of them is we do get a higher bond rate. And we do include more information than other areas. So that is um, a part of how our bond rating happens. The other is we are able to provide more assurance about that information out there to our public. 
The other thing that we get that districts, other districts in the state don't get for doing this um, award and doing our full gap financial statements is we get the mo unmodified opinion. If we um, were to go away from that, we would get what's a, a called a modified opinion. Yeah, it would be dual reporting where we get a modified opinion because we aren't full gap. Um, there's it's it's a minor thing, but it would be in your report that there's a modified that we don't follow gap in all respects in the actual okay. report. So there's kind of three benefits to sort of uh, doing full gap and doing the ACR in that regard. And is I assume there's some additional cost associated with that. Do, do we have an understanding, or is it sort of get rolled into the cost of the audit? There's some additional cost outside, and then there's some additional into the audit. I don't know the exact amount of the audit cost. Have I'd have to look. We can get that information for you, um, Director Mason. Um, okay. I don't know. My guess is it's not significant for the value that it brings, but I'm just curious. Mm -hmm. It's it's. I think last time I asked, in total, it was probably twenty ish, but it was a while ago, uh, so I don't know. Yeah. It might be more more for the audit cost yeah. itself. Okay. And you can be full gap and not go for that. Mm -hmm. for award yes. too. Mm -hmm. um, in the state of Washington, I think there's 296 districts, somewhere around that. Sure. And there's only about yeah. six or okay. so, six or less yes. districts that are gap. Yeah. And not all of those six go for the ACFR mm -hmm. award. Mm -hmm. um, so it's really a, a choice on what the district mm -hmm. would like to do. I know in the past, we've mm -hmm. been lucky enough or not. We've been excellent enough in order to receive this <laughs> this award, and so I'm very grateful that we the addition. We would still, if you were still a full gap district, you'd mm -hmm. still have to pay the additional audit costs too, because there's additional mm -hmm. work that the auditors have to do to substantiate mm -hmm. that. There it is. Yeah. yeah. The the one thing that we do let our after clients know is it can have an, a tight turnaround on your finance mm -hmm. team because the typically the award program requires that you have an audit completed of the financial statements by the end of February. Mm -hmm. So that that's Ow. pretty early. <laughs> Yeah. yeah, this year we were a little bit later, um, but and extensions can be provided for various reasons. But um, sometimes some of our governments evaluate whether or not it's too too much of a pull on mm -hmm. staff. Typically, it isn't. We we meet that deadline. This year was an unusual year in nature. Yeah. Mm -hmm. All right. I think I we're ready to stop talking about <laughs> financial statements and that report. Yeah. So. So I think we'll turn it over to Maggie and she'll walk us through the accountability results. Okay. Uh, so in addition to the financial and single audit, uh, we also performed an accountability audit. And basically the purpose of this audit is just to ascertain whether the district complied with state laws, regulations, um, contracts, grant agreements, as well as its own policies and procedures. Um, in addition, these audits also look at whether, in general, the district has adequate controls to safeguard public funds. Under the results in brief, you'll see that our audit found the district's operations complied in all material respects. And also for your reference, these results are detailed on page four of the accountability report within your packet, and it'd be um, page 42 for the folks online. So I have a question. When... Um... You say that the district follows our own policies. Are you talking about um, um, sort of internal financial policies like in Andy's department? Are you talking about like board policies that we have to oversee finances? Uh, yeah, so this would be, this would cover all um, internal policies and procedures that the district has created, um, whether it's over procurement or um, um, ASB, or um, other areas, it really anything. Um, part of part of our review is kind of the first thing we do is we we ask to see you know what are the internal policies and procedures over that area, and then typically we'll audit compliance to those um, to make sure that the district is following what it's established and that those controls are working. Do you ever um, in in your audit make recommendations on? financial policies like to help clarify or is that sort of out of your purview? Um, yes, we do. Um, we will make uh, best practice recommendations or if yeah. we see something that we think could be improved, we will communicate that. In doing the audit, did you find if any of our policies or procedures needed some additional, um, I guess you would say clarification as to how things should be done in the accountability area? 
Well, I um, think if you go to the next slide, she can talk a little bit mm -hmm. further about the results. I think that'll go right into oh, okay. um, that clarification. Okay, sure. Um, so basically we utilize a risk-based based approach to select our errors for further testing. And these are developed based on planning procedures that we perform at the beginning of the audit. Um, you'll see that we have five areas listed here that we identified for inclusion in this audit. Um, the first one, use of restricted funds, this one's basically mandated for audit by state law. And this has been an area that we've been reviewing for the past few audits. Uh, for local revenue, we basically confirmed there were no changes to the district process um, and methodology for distinguishing expenditures of state and local revenues and verified that, they, <laughs> that the district allocated expenditures in accordance with that plan. Um, and also for the professional learning, for that one, we're just making sure that the allocation is in accordance with state requirements. And um, again, this year we noted no, no um, instances of noncompliance. Um, we also um, review supplemental contracts. This is also another area that's required by, um, uh, mandated by state law. So for this one, we um, basically just select a, a few contracts that are in place for the 21-22 school year um, and make sure that they include the elements that are described within the state law. And for this area, we also noted no issues. Uh, for the third area, ASB, um, this one was selected because ASB just continues to be an area of risk um, due to the many state requirements and risks associated with fundraising um, events, cash receding um, students. <laughs> uh, additionally, it's been a few years since we've looked at this area. And as Andy was mentioning, we kind of cycle out um, different areas each year. You know, during our planning procedures, we kind of look at when was the last time we looked at these bigger um, audit areas and our, should we you know, take another look at them? So this was selected because we haven't looked at it in a while. And we also know there was some turnover in some of the positions. Uh, so for this one, what we first did is we kind of met with the district and gained an understanding of what were the district-wide policies and procedures in place over ASB. Um, what were the specific pr procedures in place for hosting fundraisers? Are there specific forms that have to be filled out and turned in? Um, and then we basically judgmentally selected five fundraisers um, from the schools that are listed. Uh, and we found that the district had adequate controls over this area. Um, we had one minor recommendation related to, to documentation, um, but I think overall uh, we didn't know any you know, major, major issues. And then um, also as part of this area, we also uh, tested compliance with the House Bill 1660. Uh, this bill basically requires that the district adopt a policy for waiving all fees for students who are eligible. And it also requires specific reporting requirements related to student participation and extracurricular activities. Uh, and again, you know, with this area, we didn't know any um, non-compliance. The district was in compliance with all the requirements outlined within state law. And then the last two areas, these are just standard areas that we review as part of all of our audits. Um, minutes were reviewed to confirm compliance with OPMA requirements. Um, in addition, we look at specific financial ratios to make sure that there's no indication of financial distress and that there doesn't need to be any specific disclosures within the um, district's uh, financial notes that need to be disclosed to end users. That's good. Mm -hmm. yeah. So overall, very clean audit for the accountability. And with that, I will turn it over to Christina. To close right, thank you, Maggie. Okay, so we're nearing the end of our presentation. So we just have a few closing remarks for you. Um, so first, we always like to provide an update on where we ended with audit costs. Um, you'll see on the screen in front of you that despite all the questions and conversations we've had, and we are pleased to report that we are still coming in under budget by about $5,000. So that was really great to see. The next audit is coming right around the corner. We're already in June. Um, so we have about seven months, six months until the next one. Um, so early 2024, um, mm -hmm. we'll be back to do the next audit. Same four areas, including the after um, award program. Uh, we have provided an estimate of that audit cost in your packet for your budgetary needs. Mm -hmm. And then our next steps on the next slide uh, will be to publish the district's two audit reports. 
Um, those should come out by the end of this month. We publish on Mondays and Thursdays. Um, so you can look for those to come out given that today is Wednesday. I'm trying to remember the day. Um, it should come out, I would anticipate next Thursday would be the published date. If you have interest, you can sign up at the link below or on the screen. It's also in your packet to receive notifications when your reports come out. And then following the publication of those reports, we do also send an opportunity to provide a customer service survey. We do really take all of the feedback very seriously. So if there's anything that you would like to share with us on how we can better um, improve our services going forward, we'd love to hear it. Um, all feedback is good feedback, so let us know. And then in terms of wrapping up today's presentation, I know Courtney and Maggie spent so much time with your staff, Mandy. Um, so I'm not sure, Maggie or Courtney, would you like to share this? Uh, sure. I just want to give a special thank you to Becky. I know she's not attending this um, conference, but um, she was, you know, a huge part of the financial audit. I know this was her first year with Everett being a, involved with the audit. Um, and she was a joy to work with. And then I also want to give a big shout out to Andy because um, Gasby 87 leases, this is, you know, Gasby keeps coming out with so many new standards and this was not a very easy one to implement. And um, it was very clear that Andy spent a lot of time um, preparing and, you know, getting this um, Gasby implemented. And um, I just want to say thank you. Mm -hmm. And I just want to say thank you to your team. Although we disagreed on the finding recommendation, we do uh, really uh, value the relationship and the partnership we build in, in that regard. And um, I want to continue that. And it's been a pleasure to work with you again, Maggie. I know it's been a while. So <laughs> perfect. So with that, um, in just conclusion, is there any last questions that we can answer for you or comments that you'd like to share? I just want to thank you. Um, we spent a lot of time, I know you did too. Okay. And uh, I really appreciate it. And even coming in under of all the time we spent. I really appreciate it, okay? So thank you. Yeah. For this. And uh, I want to publicly say to uh, Andy Tress, thank you. And you've earned everything. You work very hard. Thank you. Thank you. And directors, do you have any questions that you would, or comments that you would like to add as well? No, nothing to add. Appreciation to y'all. Yeah. Director Mason. Uh, same with me. Just uh, thank you to all and both sides, both teams for great work. I really appreciate it. And I would like to just say thank you to Maggie, Christine, Courtney, and Wendy. I would love to thank you for, for what you've done here today and clarifications that you came back with. Uh, in the past, I know we've always asked questions like, because we had certain groups that were out to get us, I think we got that way. Uh, but um, were there any questions received from any constituents about this this auditable year, 21-22? No, no citizen referrals this year. Fantastic. I appreciate that because they will be on the website looking to see if you, they found anything. So I'm just asking that question. And I would like to thank you all, Maggie, thank you so much for your work and I um, appreciate what you've done. And I would also like a big shout out to uh, Becky and Andy for their support and going to bat for the district because of the unresolved area. I would say that unresolved areas that we are still looking at. So I appreciate your effort and I thank you so much for what you've done for us. Thank you. Thank you, Andy. Thank, Thank you. you very much. Thank you. With nothing more to be said, Dr. Salston, if you have anything more. Thank you to everybody. And, and Maggie, I'm alive and to the board and to Andy and to everybody, a true thank you. Thank you. We appreciate it. Absolutely. Thank you. So with that, this meeting is adjourned. Thank you so much for attending via Zoom. We've all learned how to do that because of, guess what? <laughs> Computers. <laughs> right? Yeah, yeah. Right? And Absolutely. we've met a need that's there <laughs> by using Zoom. Thank you so much. Bye. Thank you.